Welcome to Daily Wisdom, Walking the Path with the Buddha, a podcast shared by David Roylance. This podcast is dedicated to guiding you to completely eliminate the discontent mind and the suffering it causes by attaining enlightenment. Learn and practice the teachings of Gotama Buddha that will guide you to fully attain a peaceful, calm, serene, and content mind with joy. To support this podcast, visit patreon.com forward slash support Buddha or visit buddhadailywisdom.com where you will discover a full range of courses, retreats, and online learning resources to assist you on the path to enlightenment. Now, here's our teacher to share more. Sawadikap. Hello and welcome to Daily Wisdom, Walking the Path with the Buddha. Today, we're going to be studying the four stages of enlightenment, and specifically, we're going to be talking about the 10 fetters. It's really important to understand those in order to be able to move through the four stages of enlightenment. This is our group learning program where we're using this book, Developing a Life Practice, The Path That Leads to Enlightenment, to guide our classes week by week. The content that I'm going to be sharing with you today is contained in chapter three. And we're not in chapter three yet as part of the progression of our group learning program, but this is still part of our kind of overview to help you understand the path to enlightenment and what we're going to be covering as we go forward in this program. So thank you for joining. I'm really pleased that you've decided to join and start to understand the Buddhist teachings and start to understand how to practice them so that you can experience the results. So far, what we've discussed in our previous three sessions on Sunday is the wisdom, moral conduct, and mental discipline of the Eightfold Path. We talked about the eight steps of the Eightfold Path, breaking those into three classes and three different sections. Well, all of that work that a practitioner will ultimately end up doing as they learn and progress on this path culminates into working to eliminate the 10 fetters. It's the 10 fetters that keep the mind in the unenlightened state. And by eliminating those from the mind through training, the mind is then able to progress through the four stages of enlightenment. So you can almost think of the Eightfold Path as preparation, preparing the mind to eliminate the 10 fetters. A practitioner wouldn't be able to just jump in and start working on eliminating the 10 fetters and have that go well with for them. And first, they need to start out with those three universal truths, the four noble truths, learning the Eightfold Path, the five precepts, putting together their meditation practice, and some of the other things that we've been talking about so far. All of those things we're going to be going into a lot of detail as we progress in this program. But like I said, these first few classes are just to give you an overview to understand where things are headed in this program and how you can develop your life practice in order to attain this enlightened mental state where the mind is peaceful, calm, serene, and content with joy. And it's these 10 fetters that are the ultimate goal to be eliminated from the mind. So the eightfold path is preparing the mind, almost softening it up and getting the mind to a point where it's ready to release these 10 fetters gradually through very direct, specific training. So today we're going to go through each of the individual fetters. I'm going to explain what they are, explain to you how they're eliminated, and then we're going to go into talking about the individual four stages of enlightenment. And depending on the amount of time, we may even talk about the seven factors of enlightenment. As we're going through, there's a lot of material that's being shared from week to week to week. So don't feel like you have to absorb it all and practice it all in this short period of time. This is really developing a life practice. And that's why we're going to be covering these topics multiple times throughout the program. There's no way that you could learn the Eightfold Path in three weeks and implement it and practice it to perfection in just those three weeks. So you can think of this first few classes as just, like I mentioned, an overview to kind of help you understand what the overall path looks like. And then as we go through week by week, we'll help you to develop your practice. And even then, going through this seven month program, there's plenty of students who take this program more than once so that you can more fully develop your practice as you progress. It's developing a life practice, 
not in seven months. It's not possible to fully develop it in seven months, but you can really get a really big dose of learning the Buddhist teachings through this program. And that's why I'm spending time at the beginning to help you understand this overview so that you'll have an idea of the direction we're headed with these classes and with this program. So once again, thank you for being here. Let's go ahead and look at the 10 fetters and discuss them one by one. The way that you can think about these 10 fetters is you can think about them as pollutions of the mind. We call them the taints or fetters or pollution of the mind. What a fetter is, is a fetter is like a ball in a chain that is keeping the mind stuck or trapped in the unenlightened state. And there's the lower fetters and then there's the higher fetters. And we'll talk about these as two separate groups and you'll see why as we talk about the four stages of enlightenment. But it's these 10 fetters that are keeping the mind in this unenlightened mental state where it keeps experiencing discontentedness over and over. So those pleasant feelings, painful feelings, and feelings that are neither painful nor pleasant, these pollutions of mind are what's keeping the mind there, continuing to experience this over and over and over. Now it's craving that is the true cause of discontentedness, but the mind is craving, it's holding, it's longing, it has this strong eagerness, and these are the things that the mind is holding on to, and by eradicating these from the mind through specific training, then the mind can experience this unconditioned mind, this brightness, this brilliance of the enlightened mental state. And in order to do that, you need to understand what the actual fetters are and then how to eliminate them. So let me go through them one by one and I'll be pausing like I normally do in order to give you guys a chance to ask questions. And the way that you'll do that is just put your questions into Facebook, YouTube, or Zoom. Our moderators will see that and be sure your question gets asked during the class. Or if you're in Zoom, you can electronically raise your hand and the moderators will call on you and be sure that you can ask your question or follow-up question. The first fetter is what we call personal existence view. This relates to that universal truth of non-self. Because the mind has this personal existence view, the unenlightened mind thinks that this physical body or this mind is the self. It thinks this is the permanent self. There's a certain self-image and a certain self-identity that the mind has. And it thinks that the image that is projected from this physical body is the self. And the mind will protect this. And it will become discontent if somebody comments negatively about your physical appearance in the unenlightened state or if somebody comments positively about your physical appearance, you might experience these pleasant feelings. But this is the mind basing its inner feelings on these impermanent conditions of some input or something that somebody says about the physical appearance, this self-image. And this causes the mind to be discontent as long as there's this personal existence view in the mind. Or if there's this self-identity, If you identify with yourself as a police officer or a doctor or a lawyer or a mom, a dad, a person who lives in a certain state or a certain ethnic group, while these things are all true, but if the mind identifies with it thinking that this is your identity, being a police officer or an accountant or a lawyer, and then you hear somebody talking negatively about these professions, then you're going to experience painful feelings. Or likewise, if you hear somebody that's commenting positively, you'll experience these pleasant feelings and the mind can oscillate up and down based on what other people are saying. So the mind isn't liberated in these cases because the mind is attached and it's basing its inner feelings on what other people say. The mind isn't free. It's being controlled by its own craving, desire, attachment to hear certain pleasant things from people at certain times. So as long as the mind has this personal existence view, falsely identifying with this physical body or this mind, i.e. the self-image and the self-identity, as long as the mind has this personal existence view, it will protect it mentally. It will lurch. It will try to 
knocked down and people who are maybe saying something negative or if you hear something positive you will be filled with this maybe pride or this arrogance so the teaching of the universal truth of non-self is what helps a practitioner eliminate the personal existence view and there's very specific teachings that we help you with in order to first intellectually understand what the universal truth of non-self is and what this personal existence view is. You need to understand it in much more detail than what I'm explaining today. Then you need to reflect on that, and then you need to practice in a certain way to disassociate with this personal existence view, training the mind to no longer falsely, mistakenly identify with this physical body or with this self-identity as being who you are as a person. Because if you allow the mind to try to hold on to this personal existence view, then it's just going to be shaken up anytime you hear something positive or negative about the self-image or the self-identity. And we're going to dive into this in a lot more detail in chapter 16, which is part of learning how to dissolve the ego. This is an important one to understand, but it's usually very challenging for practitioners to understand because we've built so much identity around the physical body and we build so much identity around the mind thinking that this is the permanent self. And this personal existence view is very deeply rooted in the mind. So therefore it takes many months in order to dissolve this out of the mind and it takes a lot of training to do so. So that's the first fetter. The second fetter is called doubt. Doubt is having doubt about the Buddha, the teachings, the community, your teacher, and your own ability to attain enlightenment. If you have doubt that the Buddha maybe wasn't enlightened and he didn't really have anything beneficial to teach you, then why would you ever learn and progress and really apply dedication to actually progress on this path? So at a certain degree, a practitioner will need to eventually resolve their doubt in whether the Buddha was actually enlightened or not. Same thing with the teachings. If you didn't think that the teachings were beneficial, for example, when you learn about right speech, if you learn about right speech and you're like, oh, I kind of enjoy talking negatively to people and berating people and diminishing them and degrading them. I don't think that it makes sense for me to stop doing those things. I have doubt that these teachings will even lead to enlightenment. Then if there's doubt about the teachings, then you know that's going to hinder somebody from progressing on this path to enlightenment. And then also the community. The community is all the practitioners and teachers that are part of the community that you're part of learning and progressing on this path together as a community we are there to support and encourage and motivate each other as we need support and as you reach out we're there for you if you have doubt that this community of practitioners is practicing the teachings well then why would you be a part of a community that you have doubts about or if you have doubt about your teacher being able to support you and help you along the path to enlightenment? Why would you ever spend time with that teacher to actually learn and progress? Or your own ability to attain enlightenment. If there's constant negativity, that the mind is constantly degrading itself and you doubt that you could ever actually attain enlightenment, why would you ever pursue it? So doubt is something that can erode the mind, diminish the mind, and degrade the mind to the point where it becomes complacent or maybe even gives up on the path. Now, initially, most people do have a certain amount of doubt. And I think that a certain amount of healthy doubt can actually be really helpful, that it can help you to make the effort to actually investigate the teachings. And it can give you that energy, that motivation, that enthusiasm to figure out whether the Buddha truly was enlightened and what are his actual teachings and what is this community all about and let me learn about the teacher and what the teacher's background is. So a certain amount of doubt at the beginning is really helpful because there is no such thing as blind belief as I've talked about before that you need to learn, reflect, and practice these teachings. So the doubt here that the Buddha's 
talking about that gets eroded as you start progressing on the path is a doubt that you know these things aren't any good and if that thought was maintained throughout your practice then it wouldn't lead to any beneficial results but surely there's probably some doubt when people first get started so the way that people actually eliminate their doubts is by investigating the teachings the more that you learn the teachings the more you reflect on them and the more that you practice them and you see the truth for yourself by independently verifying the teachings not believing what is being shared but instead verifying the teachings that they are truth and the more that you practice you see the condition of the mind gradually improving where the discontentedness is slowly diminishing things that once caused anger in the mind now maybe you're just irritated or a little bit annoyed and then eventually that annoyance even gets eliminated 100 percent a same situation that would have arose a significant amount of anger however many weeks or months later the mind's just peaceful as a result of practicing this eightfold path then you see that wow the buddha must have truly been enlightened because here i am learning these teachings 2500 years after his death and they're working to help me so you erode that doubt about the buddha you erode that doubt about his teachings maybe you have some interactions with the community and you see that people are supportive and encouraging and willing to help you so you erode any doubt there and the teachings that you learn that ultimately improve the condition of the mind came from your teacher so that would help you to erode any doubt about them because in order for the teachings to benefit you the teacher who's sharing them must have a certain amount of knowledge and wisdom about those teachings and being able to guide you with those teachings and perhaps even be enlightened in order to be able to share the teachings with you if the teachings that the teacher is sharing is working to improve the condition of your mind then you can erode any doubt that that teacher knows or doesn't know what they're talking about. So it kind of builds the teacher's credibility and helps to remove doubt from your mind. And then as you see that as you're learning, reflecting, and practicing, and these teachings are in fact benefiting your life and improving the condition of the mind, then it starts to erode doubt about your own ability to progress on this path. And you start seeing like, well, yeah, I can do this because three months ago I wasn't even meditating and now I've kind of built up my meditation practice and things are going pretty well and I've diminished a lot of discontent in this year and I'm starting to build relationships with people in my community in ways that I wasn't able to do before and I'm noticing my relationships are improving and when you start seeing these improvements in your life, it starts to erode your doubt whether or not you can actually accomplish enlightenment or not. So that's how you actually erode doubt is by actually investigating the teachings and seeing that they're actually working. But if you have a little bit of doubt at the beginning, like I said, I think that can be helpful. It can be actually a motivator to encourage you to actually investigate the teachings. So if you have doubt now, that's fine. But just know that you'll need to erode that over time. And the way that you do that is by investigating the teachings practicing them and seeing that they're actually working to improve the condition of the mind. This third fetter is called wrong grasp of behaviors and observances. There's kind of two different aspects to this. One aspect is that if the mind believes that it's rites, rituals, ceremonies, and worship that is going to help a practitioner attain enlightenment, this would be wrong grasp of behavior and observances because if you understand anything from what we've been talking about in these classes so far is that in order to attain enlightenment you need to learn reflect and practice you need to train the mind there needs to be a certain amount of learning and this active practice in order to erode and eliminate certain pollution from the mind training it to practice the teachings in a certain way that improves the condition of the mind it's not by sprinkling water on you or tying a certain rope on you or having you recite a few chants or something like that it's not about bowing down or worshiping a statue or anything like this it's not about these rites rituals and ceremonies that's going to bring about better results in your life it's about gaining wisdom and making better decisions in your life that's what's going to improve the condition of the mind and the condition of your life 
It's gaining wisdom and making better decisions in your life. That's why you've encountered all the struggles and difficulties in your life is because you've just lacked the wisdom of how to make wise decisions. And the Buddhist teachings are providing you that guidance to be able to discover this wisdom. And once you confirm it, then you'll make wiser and wiser decisions to improve the condition of the mind and the condition of your life. But rites, rituals, ceremonies, and worship won't do that for you. The Buddha lived, he taught, he died, and he's never coming back again. He left his teachings to help us. He never taught any kind of rites, rituals, ceremonies, or worship whatsoever. So it's all about learning, gaining wisdom, and making wiser and wiser choices in our life to produce more wholesome outcomes, right? That's what's ultimately going to lead to enlightenment and eradicate this wrong grasp of behavior and observances. Also, a well-developed practice of the Eightfold Path is what will improve this wrong grasp of behavior and observances. This is where the mind is learning and practicing all those steps on the Eightfold Path in order to develop your practice with wisdom, moral conduct, and mental discipline. In doing so, this is what prepares the mind to eliminate all of these other fetters. And you wouldn't be able to eliminate them without having a well-developed practice of the Eightfold Path. So even though we're not talking about the four stages of enlightenment yet, I would like to share with you these first three fetters is what will move the mind into the first stage of enlightenment. And that's what the mind needs to do is practice this eightfold path, develop your life practice really, really well, experiencing those jhanas that we talked about in the last class. And as the mind's experiencing those jhanas, that's where you have the indication that you're on the right path. You've putting together enough of the Eightfold Path that it's producing this clarity, this concentration, this equanimity, this mindfulness in the mind. You're seeing this diminishing of discontentedness. You're seeing this arising of some joy and peacefulness in the mind. Once a practitioner is starting to experience those jhanas, we know that, okay, you're putting together the Eightfold Path really well, and now it's time to start really honing in on these first three fetters so that you can move the mind into this first stage of enlightenment. And we'll talk about that here in a bit. This fourth fetter is called central desire. This is where the unenlightened mind has craving and desire through the six sense bases. There's five senses that you've probably learned as part of any kind of learning that you might have learned as growing up in science class, but in the Buddhist teachings, there's six senses. There's the five that you know about, the eyes, the ears, the nose, the tongue, and the body. This is the five senses of how the mind then interacts with the world and becomes aware of certain things in the world. But then there's this sixth sense of the mind. And essentially what's happening with central desire is the mind is looking for those pleasant feelings. It's chasing after the objects of its affection, thinking that it can just satisfy these eyes or the ears or the nose or the tongue or the bodily contact or the mind itself. And by pursuing and chasing after the objects of its affection, it will get these pleasant feelings. But because those pleasant feelings are temporary, they're unsatisfying. They don't actually last. They're just temporary and they fade away. And it's because the mind is chasing after the objects of its affection through these sense bases that it's continuing to experience discontentedness. So th through the eyes, the mind is seeking agreeable forms. It wants things that are pleasing and agreeable, enticing. You want to see pleasing things. And that arises in the mind, these pleasant feelings. But the mind is discontent at that point because it's basing its inner feelings on these impermanent conditions. And as soon as those agreeable forms are no longer there and the mind sees through the eyes disagreeable forms, then that's where it becomes painful. The mind experiences these painful feelings. So let me give you an example. So let's just say you see a beautiful sports car go by 
and in your mind you have this craving and desire to have a beautiful sports car and you see this beautiful sports car go by oh wow it's so beautiful look at that shiny car oh my goodness i just wish i could have that car i would just have everything that i want in life i just want that beautiful car so 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 much so that i see this form this beautiful car and it craves it, it wants it, and it gets these pleasant feelings. Maybe you even rent the car for a period of time and you start really enjoying this car. But then you have to return the car because that was a temporary situation. You can't hold on to it permanently. You have to return it. And now you go back to your car and your car has scratches on it. The fabric is maybe messed up in the car. And now you see this disagreeable form with the eyes And now the mind has this sadness or this frustration that you can't have this pleasing thing that the mind is longing for. So this is just one example through the eyes. And there's multiple forms that an unenlightened mind is going to be craving through the eyes. But also there's certain sounds with the ears. There's certain music that you like, for example. And when you hear that music, it's agreeable and you take pleasure in it. But then if you hear music you don't like, maybe you get frustrated or irritated because it's disagreeable to you. Or if you hear a certain sound that you don't like, it might arise anger or frustration. Same thing with the nose. There are certain odors, agreeable and disagreeable, that will arise pleasant feelings and painful feelings. There are certain flavors of the tongue. Again, pleasant feelings and painful feelings. Certain bodily contact. There's certain agreeable bodily contact that will arise pleasant feelings. And there's disagreeable bodily contact that will arise painful feelings. And then there's certain things that the mind is longing for itself. Certain agreeable things and then it experiences disagreeable things. And because the mind is longing through these sense bases for pleasant feelings, it's only a matter of time before those conditions change and now it's going to experience painful feelings. So the mind needs to eliminate and eradicate sensual desire in order to completely get to enlightenment. But this is a process of gradually training the mind in this direction. It's not something that's gonna happen overnight. One of the strongest sensual desires that human beings tend to have for some people is the desire for sexual contact. There's lots of things involved with that. There's a certain form that we see, there's certain sounds that we hear, there might be certain scents, and there's other aspects of this with the tongue and the body, bodily contact in the mind. And this is something that ultimately, by the time somebody gets to complete enlightenment, they will no longer be having sexual contact. That might not be where you are right now in your life, and that's completely fine. You don't need to give up sexual contact at any other time. You're not required to do that. It's when or if you're ready to do that, then you choose to do that on your own. But as you'll see when we talk about the four stages of enlightenment, you can actually go into the first and second stage of enlightenment while still having sexual contact, but you're still going to observe some discontentedness around that. But ultimately, in order to move into the third and fourth stage of enlightenment, a practitioner will ultimately need to let go of sexual contact. And that's something that oftentimes happens naturally as we age anyway. But there are things that you can do if you're looking to actively train the mind to eliminate that, that we can do with meditation and some other things in order to help you to eliminate any kind of sexual cravings or desires as part of this fetter. But this only happens when or if you would like to do that. Some people that are maybe in their 20s or their 30s that maybe they're interested in starting a family, maybe they're in a relationship that they really enjoy sexual contact. They may continue to learn and practice this path, moving all the way into the first and second stage of enlightenment. And then when or if they and their partner are ready, they might choose later in life to let go of sexual contact and then move the mind further into the third and fourth stage of enlightenment. But in that first and second stage of enlightenment, there's a significant diminishing 
of discontentedness and you'd be very pleased having accomplished that and you still would be able to enjoy sexual contact if you'd like. But then when you're ready, when or if, you can choose to move further in your progression. There's no judgment from anybody on this path. It should be your own personal journey. And when you choose to eliminate these fetters, it's completely up to you. It's your personal journey to enlightenment. The fifth fetter here is called ill will. This is all about hostility, hatred, anger, aggression, resentment, frustration, irritation, and annoyance. This is how the mind pushes people away. It becomes hostile and aggressive at people when it doesn't get its cravings fulfilled. So this central desire is how the mind is craving certain pleasant feelings through the sense bases. If it gets the objects of its affection, it experiences these temporary pleasant feelings. But if it doesn't get what it wants or those feelings fade, that's oftentimes when this anger, this hatred, this ill will comes into the mind and the mind kind of looks out for enemies around you. These are the people that I agree with and the people that I like. This is my tribe. These are the people that I don't associate with and I don't like these people. And I kind of push these people out of my life. And there are certain conditions that the unenlightened mind looks for and it wants everybody to kind of conform to their conditions. And if this group of people that you agree with, if at any time there are certain people there that don't meet your conditions, then you might have hostility or anger or aggression towards them, and then maybe proceed to kind of push them out of your life. And the unenlightened mind will oftentimes look out for this and kind of look for enemies around us. This is from our animal instincts, our hostility, our anger, aggression, and it can really be detrimental to the mind because if you go around with this hostility in the mind, you can't be open and loving to all beings around you. You can't experience healthy relationships in your personal and professional life because it's only a matter of time before the anger and the hostility comes into the mind and you might be aggressive with certain people around you. And then as you're aggressive with certain people and you push them out of your life or they choose to leave your life because of your aggression and hostility, then you find it very difficult and you struggle because of this ill will that's in the mind. So this needs to be eradicated from the mind and it's something that we actually start working on very early in your practice. This is what we're going to be talking about two Wednesdays from now is loving kindness meditation and practicing loving kindness. And we're going to be talking about it at other points in the program too, but that's what actually eradicates and transforms this ill will and eradicates it from the mind so that you can then be loving and kind with this genuine interest in seeing all beings be well, rather than having this hostility and anger towards people. And as you have this more loving and this more kind, this polite, kind, friendly, respectful way of being around people, you'll see that your relationships truly blossom. Your professional and your personal relationships will tend to go very smooth for you because you're not lashing out at people with any kind of aggression. So let me pause here and see what questions you guys have on the lower fetters before we talk about the higher fetters. The way that you can ask a question is just put that into Facebook, YouTube, or Zoom, and our moderators will be sure your question gets asked. And then in Zoom, you can electronically raise your hand and you'll be called on so that you can ask any questions that you might have. I thought I would start us off with a question in regards to, to number four. I was wondering, what is it about sensual desire that that set one back essentially that makes it a better is it the craving essentially for instance if one listened to music or enjoyed a nice meal would those be fetters or would it be essentially the if one had craving for them that would make them fetters yeah it so an enlightened being can listen to music they can enjoy their food they can do these type of things, but they don't have the craving in the mind, that mental longing and strong eagerness. So let me give you another example. Let's say that you had a favorite restaurant that you knew has this amazing chocolate cake and you're interested in going to this restaurant and having a meal and getting this chocolate cake at the end of your meal and your mind almost just obsesses about it. 
and okay, so you make this plan, you go out to this restaurant, you order your food, everybody has a great dinner, and then you get to dessert, and it's like, okay, I would like to order that chocolate cake. And of course, the mind wants this chocolate cake really, really bad because it wants to please the tongue with this chocolate cake. Well, at that point, if the server says, sorry, we're out of chocolate cake, we don't have that anymore. This is where the mind can become angered and frustrated and irritated and maybe even turn into unskillful speech or unskillful actions because of it. And this is where we put harm into the world and therefore harm comes to us. Whereas if a person doesn't have the craving and it's, oh, we don't have the chocolate cake, ma'am, or we don't have the chocolate cake, sir. Oh, okay. Well, what do you have? Maybe you switch to another dessert or maybe you just choose not to get any dessert at all. So it's all about the craving, the longing, the yearning, the strong eagerness. That's what needs to be eliminated from the mind, where the mind no longer has this yearning, this desire, this longing for things through the senses. Because if you have this longing and yearning for these pleasant feelings through the senses, you can't satisfy that permanently because of the universal truth of impermanence. So therefore, if you allow the mind to crave for those pleasant feelings for something like chocolate cake, for example, then it's only a matter of time before impermanence comes along and those painful feelings come into the mind. So essentially what eliminating central desire is, is it's training the mind to eliminate craving desire attachment. And it's training the mind to no longer base its inner feelings on these impermanent conditions that it's experiencing through the senses. I was also wondering, is there a relationship between four and five such that four is a pulling toward one and five is a pushing away? Whereas what we're looking for is more of a acceptance of what is in the moment, essentially? Yeah, you can look at it that way, that central desire is craving desire attachment, where it's longing through these sense bases and trying to pull things towards the mind and hold on to them very tightly, wanting these pleasant feelings through the eyes, ears, nose, tongue, body, and mind. And then if it gets the objects of its affection, that's where those pleasant feelings will arise. But when that fades, or if you don't get the objects of your affection, that's where the ill will the hatred, the anger, the hostility, the aggression will arise and we will push things away through our aggression and our hostility. All of these 10 fetters bubble up to what we call the three poisons or the three unwholesome roots or the three fires, which we're going to be talking about in chapter eight. But this is a detailed description of each individual fetter. So it's like going in with a more exact tool to really eradicate each individual fetter, where when we talk about these generally as the three unwholesome roots or the three fires or the three poisons, there's more generalized guidance that applies there. But then when you look at it more deeply in the 10 fetters, there's very specific things that we apply in order to eradicate these conditions from the mind, eradicating this pollution or this taints or these balls and chains that keeping the mind trapped in the unenlightened state. And I was wondering in regards to personal existence view, is this the intellectual elimination of the concept of a permanent self, or is it something a bit deeper than that that we're going for in regards to eliminating this fetter? Eliminating personal existence view has two aspects to it. There's the intellectual learning to understand what the personal existence view is and understanding the universal truth of non-self. There's a a deep amount of intellectual learning that has to go on there. And that usually happens over multiple sessions of classes and also personal guidance and discussing it. So there's a certain amount of intellectual learning, but then you have to move it into practice where you start disassociating with the physical body and with the mind as being the self. So we say things like, you know, this is my water or these are my clothes, or my computer, or my job, or my house, my wife, my husband, my partner, my kids. And we have all this my, 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 and we kind of grab onto it because of this personal existence view. 
it's craving, desire, attachment at the heart of it. But it's this personal existence view holding on really tightly to mine, 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 mine. We even spend all this time in some cases trying to beautify the physical body, our hair, putting on makeup or jewelry or other things like this. And with our self-identity, we put all this investment in our self-identity, maybe acquiring certain skills and all of these things. Now, there's no harm in ensuring that you look presentable when you go outside in public. There's no harm with training to get more education and becoming something like a lawyer or an accountant or a police officer or any other occupation that's out there or being a mom or a dad or any kind of self-identity that you would think about. There's no issues with those things. What it is is if the mind latches onto it and holds onto it then that's where the problem comes in. So part of the training, once you understand intellectually what personal existence view is and what the universal truth of non-self is, then as you advance in your practice, we start helping you learn how to disassociate with these things. And rather than my water, it's the water. Or rather than my clothes, it's the clothes. And you start kind of changing your thought process and the way that you think about the things around you. That it's not my house, it's the place where I live. It's not my car, it's the transportation that I use. And doing these small little things, along with some other techniques, we have some specialized meditation that we do in order to help eradicate this personal existence view from the mind. By doing all these different things, both learning intellectually and then implementing some things into your practice, you start observing that you're letting go of this self. And that's where things that may be in the past that you would hear that would maybe bother the mind doesn't cause any discontentedness whatsoever. So let's say that you have a certain ethnicity, that you're Caucasian or you're Asian or you're African-American or maybe your sexuality, maybe you're a um, person who prefers same-sex relationships, or maybe you are comfortable having relationships with men and female at different times, or things like this. And if you were watching the news, or you were hearing certain things that were happening, and you heard someone talking in a derogatory way about someone who likes same-sex relationships, or someone was talking in a derogatory way about a certain ethnicity group that this particular existence has come from, Maybe you're African-American or maybe you're Asian or maybe you're a Caucasian. And in the past where you would hear these things on the TV or you would hear people out in public saying certain negative things where it would maybe really bother you as you start to disassociate with this personal existence view, it doesn't bother you anymore. You still hear it. You still know that they're talking about these things. But instead of choosing to get angry about it, the mind has been trained so well, you start to recognize that that person who's talking in a derogatory way about the ethnicity that this body came from, that's not me. That's not who I am. While this body may be African-American, that's not my identity. That's not who I am. This physical body doesn't decide who I am or this identity that the mind holds on to. It doesn't decide who I am. So now in those situations where you hear things on TV or you hear things from other people, it doesn't shake up the mind anymore. You just notice that, okay, this is their lack of wisdom, their lack of moral conduct, their lack of mental discipline, that they're not practicing loving kindness and compassion for all beings. And that's why they have a negative view of certain ethnicities or certain sexual orientations or things like this and what benefit is it for me to get angry at that person and then hold on to that anger for the next few hours or the next few days because that person is lacking wisdom moral conduct and mental discipline why does it make sense for me to get hostile and angry put myself in a compromising situation when it's just that they haven't developed their life practice they're not on the path to learning and practicing to have warm, loving relationships with all beings. And rather than look down on that person or judge that person for being bad, just see it for what it is. See it clearly, which is just a lack of wisdom, a lack of moral conduct, and a lack of mental discipline. And you can just move on with your day 
because you no longer associate this physical body or this self-image as being who you are, and you no longer associate any kind of identity with your job or your ethnicity or your sexual orientation or any other things like this, you don't identify with those as being who you are as a person because all of those things are impermanent. This physical body is impermanent, so it can't be a permanent self. The things that you choose to do in terms of your occupation or other things that in your, your, in your life, those are all impermanent too. So if you start identifying with this physical body and with certain attributes of your life as being who you are, then when you hear people talk negatively, it's going to really affect the mind and shake it up. And a person who's on this path is looking to have stability in the mind and steadiness in the mind. And they're not interested in having their mind shaken up every time somebody chooses to speak negatively, for example, about these certain things. So by disassociating with this self-image and this self-identity as being who you are as a person, then the mind can reside peaceful. But as long as it holds on to this personal existence view, thinking that this physical body or this identity in the mind is who you are, then people can shake up your mind by just saying something negative about the physical appearance or anything that the mind identifies with, and you'll just be continually shaken up over and over and over again. The mind isn't liberated. It can't reside peaceful. It doesn't have any freedom from these strong feelings because every little word or every little thing that somebody says just shakes up the mind. But by eliminating this personal existence view, no longer associating with the self-image and self-identity, realizing non-self, realizing that there is no self here, that it's just a physical body and it's just a mind that has come together for this existence. When you eradicate that personal existence view, then the mind can reside more peaceful and it won't get shaken up in those situations. Thank you, David. Let's go to Nick now. Hi, teacher. I have a question from Kaya. She asks, can you sit in your feelings at times, like listening to sad music to let you work through them? I don't advise that because the sadness is going to just permeate in the mind. And the longer you allow the sad feelings to permeate in the mind, it's going to affect the condition of the mind for longer and longer periods. And ultimately, it can form what we call mental objects in the mind, which are much harder to root out. The way to get rid of the sadness is not to allow it to permeate in the mind and affect the condition of the mind long term, but instead train the mind to cut it off and let it go. By allowing the sadness to permeate in the mind, you're just extending the amount of time that the mind's going to feel sad and it's going to keep holding on to those situations that are causing the sadness. Instead, you've got to realize that the craving desire attachment that is causing the sadness, figure out what that is. And then when you eradicate the craving desire attachment, then the sadness won't arise. This comes with training as part of the entire eightfold path. There's an entire path here to learn and practice that will ultimately eradicate the sadness. But sitting with it and allowing it to permeate is just going to affect the mind for longer and longer periods of time. So I don't advise that. I don't suggest that. Thank you, Teacher David. Would, would you suggest it's best to start with meditation? The best thing to do is start with learning the three universal truths and the four noble truths. This is part of right view. You have to understand that first before you can move into understanding the rest of the path. There's no harm in starting with meditation. There's a lot of people who start with meditation. There's a lot of people around the world that are meditating. But that's step eight of the Eightfold Path. That's like starting at the finish line. Instead, you would like to build this life practice from the beginning with a really strong foundation, strong walls, strong inner walls, a strong ceiling, strong rafters, and build up your practice so that it's nice and stable and steady. And the way that you do that is start the same place that the Buddha started. After his enlightenment, his very first discourse to his very first five students was the Four Noble Truths. That's what establishes right view. And without right view, 
none of the rest of the teachings of the Buddha are really going to make sense because you don't understand why you're actually meditating. You don't understand why is it that I'm working on right speech or right action or some of these other things or why am I even trying to eradicate personal existence view or why am I trying to eradicate ill will and some of these other things. So I always suggest students start out with right view, which is the three universal truths, the four noble truths. And that's why in this program on the very first Sunday, I start off with that. And then this book, chapter four, is devoted to that. So chapters one, two, and three are kind of warming the reader up in order to get to the point where they can actually start with chapter four. That's really the place where you start learning what's causing the discontentedness and how to eliminate it from the mind. That's where I would suggest to start. Okay, thank you, sir. You're welcome. Thank you, Nick. Let's get about some now. Forum, thank you, James. We have a question on Zoom from Rick. He asks, do the first three fetters, desire for money, power, and prestige, and hold on to certain views, constitute sensual desire for the mind, how do these things fit? in with the concept of sensual desire. Can you name off those three things that Rick had at the beginning of his question? Yeah, sure. Desire for money, power, and prestige, and holding on to certain views. Yeah, so desiring money can potentially be part of more than one of these fetters, as well as prestige and other things. It can relate to personal existence view. It can relate to central desire, and it can also relate to conceit, which you're going to see in the higher fetters. So each aspect of a person's practice is going to map into these fetters in different ways. So that's why it's important to work directly with a teacher. And as the teacher gets to know more about your life and what you're involved in, we start to understand your mind and we can provide you guidance of what you need. It's almost like a Buddhist teacher is almost like a pharmacist. We are listening to the symptoms of the students, or uh, you can think of it like a doctor. I, I say pharmacist because here in Thailand, a pharmacist can prescribe medicine, but you can think of it like a doctor. A Buddhist teacher is listening to the various symptoms from their students and then prescribing certain antidotes or certain tools to use. So these things that you're talking about, if a student comes to me and says, hey, I'm having a lot of craving for money or I have a lot of craving for power or prestige, then there are certain parts of their practice that knowing more about their life, we're going to be working with them to help them resolve those aspects of their mind. So they actually, the ones that you mentioned, Rick, map into more than one of these fetters. Madame Lofkis, are the first five fetters in any specific order based on their significance or level of ease one might have in eliminating them? Not necessarily. The personal existence view is, is quite challenging for most people to eliminate. It's really challenging for people to understand what it is first off and then to actually learn how to eradicate it and it takes quite a while for people to eradicate the personal existence view. So that is actually one of the most challenging, I think, uh, for most practitioners, as well as central desire. This is a really challenging one. So they're not in necessarily in an order from uh, least difficult to more difficult. It's just in terms of how the Buddha laid them out. Typically what we do is we use them as a roadmap and as a guide, but there's the possibility that you could eradicate something like ill will before you eradicate doubt, for example, or, or some of these other ones. So while we use it as a roadmap and as a personal guide, it doesn't mean that the fetters are necessarily going to be eliminated in order, and they're not necessarily in order of importance or order of difficulty either. Well, Manal continue asking, did Gautama Buddha have insight into which fetters were deemed most stubborn to eradicate completely in the first five fetters? I don't have any places where the Buddha talks about that specifically, but I suspect that he looked at the personal existence view and conceit as two of the more challenging ones because he tends to talk about those frequently, as well as central desire 
and ill will. He talks about those quite a bit in his teachings as well, particularly central desire. Those are the ones that he spends the most time discussing, so we can kind of maybe conclude that those are the ones that he considered to be the most difficult, most challenging, but it's hard to say at this point. Uh, we know what the fetters are, we know how to eliminate them, and that's the goal, is to really work to eliminate these fetters. Last part of my last question, she asks, does one graduate to the later five fetters only after eradicating these first five? Yeah, you'll see as we look at the four stages of enlightenment that these need to be eradicated in order to move through the various phases. If you say you eradicate one of the upper fetters, but there's still these lower fetters that are there, then the mind isn't going to get into the first stage of enlightenment. So for example, you have to eradicate the first, second, and third fetter just to get to the first stage of enlightenment. But let's just say you eradicated number five ill will but personal existence view still was there well the mind isn't going to progress into a later stage of enlightenment until the lower fetters are are eliminated so if personal existence view is still there even if you've eradicated all the other fetters you're still not in the first stage of enlightenment because this fetter of personal existence view is still holding on so we tend to kind of work at them kind of in order, so to speak, but not exactly. You're kind of almost working on all of them kind of simultaneously in the way that we talked about the Eightfold Path, that you don't just work on step one before you move to step two of the Eightfold Path. You're working on all of them at the same time. It's the same thing with these fetters, that once you move and progress in your practice, you're really kind of working on all of them uh, simultaneously but there's a lot of emphasis that is important to put on this first fetter of personal existence view once the mind reaches to the jhanas because at that point the mind's ready to let it go and you've already put together all the aspects of the eightfold path that you're kind of practicing that you know pretty well in that you really deeply understand it and you're practicing it pretty well and you have the capacity to now focus on something else beyond the Eightfold Path. So you can almost think about the Eightfold Path as like that foundation in order to really lay a really good foundation of your life practice. And then once you've got that foundation, then it's time to focus on putting up the walls, for example. So once you've got that good foundation of the Eightfold Path and you're deeply practicing that and understanding that, that's when the jhanas are going to start to be experienced. And now you have the capacity to start focusing on understanding and eliminating these fetters. Thank you, teacher. No more questions for now. Okay. So let's move to the higher fetters and discuss these. So the higher fetters, the f sixth one of the entire fetters, but the first one of the higher fetters is called desire for form. And then I'll combine this one with the seventh one, which is desire for formless. This is where the practitioner needs to eliminate from the mind any desire for rebirth. Because oftentimes there's people who are interested in being reborn. They want to come back and be a human again, or they want to come back and be an animal or desire for formless. They would desire to be reborn in one of the formless realms like heaven. And the formless realms are hell, afflicted spirits and heavenly realm. Well, if you have a desire, if you have a craving to be reborn in heaven, then you're not going to be able to fully eradicate all the pollution in the mind because the mind still has craving, desire, attachment. It wants something. It expects something. And a mind has to eradicate any kind of desire for being reborn into a form realm, which is animal and human, or any of the formless realms, which is hell, afflicted spirits, and heavenly realm. And eradicating those two from the mind where you just have no desire whatsoever to have rebirth, then you will have eradicated these two. And some of you might be at that point right now, right? And that's why, like, even though you might have eradicated those two, you still need to eradicate the lower ones. So if you have a desire through your upbringing to be reborn in heaven and you think that that's going to be an eternal resting place and you only get one life and you would like to do good in this life, die and go to heaven and reside there permanently, 
that's not the way any of this works whatsoever. That's not the way that the natural laws of existence work. There is no permanence in these realms. You can't be reborn into heaven and reside there permanently. And as long as you have a craving to do that, the mind is going to be discontent. It's holding on to something. So you will need to eradicate those from the mind. The eighth one is called conceit. This is where you need to eliminate any kind of arrogance, pride, judging, measuring and comparing as being superior or inferior to others. This is where the ego is completely dissolved. The personal existence view in conceit is what we call the ego. The word ego didn't exist during the lifetime of the Buddha. So when we get into chapter 16, I will explain to you more about what the ego is and why it needs to be dissolved and how to dissolve it. But this particular fetter, once it's completely dissolved, along with the first fetter, that's when the ego is completely eliminated. But the reason why this is a pollution of mind is if you've ever been arrogant or you've ever been around someone who's arrogant, you don't enjoy that, right? You don't enjoy being around someone who's arrogant and you don't enjoy the reaction that you get if you've ever been arrogant around people or if you've been prideful or you judge others and you kind of measure and compare. If you walk around thinking that you're superior to everyone and you talk down to people, this isn't going to promote healthy relationships for you. People aren't going to like that and you're not going to be able to relate to other individuals in a polite, kind, friendly, and respectful way. And that arrogance that you put out, that boastfulness, it's going to result in unwholesome results. But likewise, if you ever think that you're inferior to people and you walk around thinking that you're lower than people and you look up to people and you kind of have this negative self-talk and you diminish yourself, this is going to create potentially shyness in the mind, uncommonness, anxiety, uh, sweaty palms. You're going to finding it very difficult to speak to people who you look up to because you feel that you're inferior to them. This is very dangerous to the mind, having any kind of arrogance, pride, judging, or measuring that you're above or below people. So what you would like to do is practice where you're completely humble and you don't look at yourself either above people or below people, but you look at all people equally. We're going to be talking about this more when we talk about chapter 14, when we get into the four healthy mental states, we'll be talking about equanimity and how to practice equanimity and looking across the world as everyone is equal. And we'll also be talking about it in chapter 16 when we talk about dissolving the ego. So conceit is something that needs to be eradicated from the mind. As long as there's arrogance and pride there, the mind can't be enlightened. This is why if somebody walks around claiming they are enlightened, that's one of the easiest ways to know that somebody isn't enlightened because an enlightened being isn't going to have arrogance and pride. They're not going to be walking around looking for admiration from people just because someone thinks that they're enlightened. So if someone's walking around claiming that they're enlightened, you can be sure that they're not because there's arrogance and pride there. There's still conceit. The ego isn't dissolved yet. And in order to get to enlightenment, that person would need to dissolve their conceit. And an enlightened being isn't going to go around with this arrogance and pride looking for admiration from people by claiming that they're enlightened. A person's mind who's enlightened is so peaceful, calm, serene, and content with joy, they can just go through life and enjoy life. They don't want this admiration. They don't have this desire for everyone to know that they're enlightened. They're just enjoying their peaceful, calm, serene, and content mind with joy. They don't have this arrogance and pride and boastfulness looking for people to acknowledge that they are enlightened. They should know themselves that they are enlightened and they don't need the confirmation from somebody else through their admiration or any kind of gratitude. So we'll talk about this more as we progress in the program. Number nine is what we call restlessness. This is like a confused, distracted, worried, anxious, restless state of mind. It's the exact opposite 
of singleness of mind. This is like anxiety. This is where like the mind is overactive. You can oftentimes see this in yourself if you're sitting somewhere and you're constantly tapping your fingers or you're bobbing your knee or you're talking really, really fast, really rapidly. This is because the mind is restless. If the mind is overactive and it's producing a lot of stimulation, you're going to be kind of tapping the fingers because you're bored and you're kind of looking to kind of get that energy of the overactive mind out or you're going to be bobbing your knee. There's going to be bodily movements that show that the mind is restless. Those bodily movements are coming from the mind because remember, the mind is the boss and the body is the employee. So if the boss is overactive and restless, then the employees are going to be the same way. So you're going to see this overactivity in the bodily movements. So as part of the training of this path to enlightenment, you train the mind to be calm and peaceful, where it's serene, where it has this calmness and composure, even in difficult situations. So we're going to be talking about this one because equanimity is what eradicates restlessness of mind and training the mind in meditation and all the other things that we do as part of this path is helping to eradicate this one. Number 10 is actually the real big one. This is the the number one problem that's keeping the mind in the unenlightened state is it's referred to as ignorance. But ignorance is oftentimes used in a derogatory way today. The Buddha didn't use this word in a derogatory way. We're translating this as ignorance. But a more appropriate way to really translate this better is not ignorance, but what I call the unknowing of true reality, that an unenlightened mind doesn't understand true reality. We could say, yes, it has this ignorance or this lack of wisdom would be kind of a polite way to say it. This unknowing of true reality, this delusion, this confusion, right? So The reason why the mind is experiencing discontentedness in the unenlightened state is because, of course, it has that craving, desire, attachment that's causing the discontentedness, but it doesn't even realize, the unenlightened mind doesn't even realize that it's causing its own discontentedness because of this ignorance or this unknowing of true reality, this lack of wisdom. The unenlightened mind doesn't understand what it doesn't understand. It doesn't understand is causing its own discontentedness. It doesn't understand this anger, this hostility, this aggression, this resentment is only hurting you. It doesn't understand things like right speech and that by going out in the world and speaking in unskillful ways, it's actually causing you problems. It doesn't understand that causing harm through our bodily actions is actually causing you problems. It's causing us, the person who's doing it, it's causing us problems. We go around and we knock down trees and we burn up the forest and then we don't understand why we smell so much smoke. Or another way to say that is we go around speaking harshly and aggressively, we harm through our bodily actions and then we don't understand why our life is so difficult and why can't we just get along with everybody. Well, the reason why is because we don't have the wisdom in order to practice these good, wholesome teachings in order to have healthy personal and professional relationships. Therefore, the harm that we're putting out is coming back to us. So we don't understand in the unenlightened state things like the three universal truths, the four noble truths, the eightfold path, the five precepts, the three wholesome and unwholesome roots. We don't understand the natural law of gamma. We don't understand the cycle of rebirth and all these other detailed teachings that are part of this path to enlightenment. We just don't understand them. We don't understand what we don't understand. We have this ignorance, this lack of wisdom. So by investigating the teachings, learning them, reflecting and practicing to improve the condition of the mind, then we eradicate this ignorance through acquiring wisdom because we see the truth for ourselves, We don't believe the teachings. Instead, we learn them, reflect on them and practice them. And we see the truth for ourselves. And when we look at the sky and we see the sky is blue, we know the sky is blue and nobody can convince us otherwise. And therefore, when the mind knows the truth and it acquires this wisdom, then you can actively work in your practice to build up your life practice 
develop this wisdom, this moral conduct, this mental discipline, and as the mind diminishes discontentedness, becomes more and more peaceful, calm, serene, and content with joy, this ignorance is eradicated because you now understand the natural laws of existence. That's what the mind is ignorant to. It's ignorant to the natural laws of existence and it doesn't understand how to operate in this world. And an unenlightened mind is having struggles and having difficulties because it's lacking the wisdom. It has this ignorance, this unknowing of true reality. So the way that you eradicate it is by doing like you're doing, learning the teachings in a class, reading books, watching these videos, applying yourself to learn these teachings, but then don't believe them. Then you reflect and you practice and see the truth and you gain this wisdom and more and more you eradicate all these pollutions of mind and as you experience more and more peacefulness, you'll see that the condition of the mind's improving. Therefore, you'll know that this is the path to enlightenment and you're understanding the truth because your mind is just getting more and more peaceful and your life becomes more and more peaceful. It's no longer a struggle and difficult because you have the wisdom of how to make wise decisions. And the more wisdom that you have, the more wise decisions that you make, the more wholesome things that happen for you in your life. And as these wholesome things are happening more and more, and the unwholesome things are diminishing more and more because of your improved decision making, then you know, hmm, this is the truth. This is the wisdom of the Buddha that's working to improve the condition of the mind in the condition of your life. So this is the ultimate fetter that's actually causing all the problems of the unenlightened mind. And eradicating this with wisdom is what moves the mind to enlightenment. So let's see what questions you guys have here. Let's get a Nick to start us off. Hello, teacher. Kaya has a question. She asks, if we are all equal, how are parents on a higher level? For example, when growing up, the voicing of your concern, but then your parents saying, they don't get to have input or you don't get to have input because you are the child. Right. So what I'm sharing is what the natural laws of existence are, but not everyone's practicing those. Right. So in a situation where a parent is putting themselves above their child and talking down to their children, you didn't like that. Right. And it didn't foster a healthy relationship. And the reason why is because that's not part of the natural laws of existence. So by more and more beings practicing equanimity and practicing in a way where all beings are equal, then what we see is we see healthy personal and professional relationships. So what you're sharing is that in your situation or maybe you're observing in other situations where people aren't practicing that, yeah, there's difficulties, right? There's struggles. And that's why, because they're not practicing the natural laws of existence. If we practice in a way where all beings are equal, then we can have peaceful personal and professional relationships. Thank you, teacher. You're welcome. We've looked at the 10 different fetters now, and we see that each potentially has its own resolutions. I was wondering, is this where it's particularly important to speak with a teacher to see what fetters we have and how to resolve them? You can be sure that you have probably the vast majority of these fetters. In order to get to the jhanas, a practitioner would have needed to work with a teacher you're not gonna end up in the jhanas by accident. So in order to get there, you would need to deeply understand right view and have a teacher's help to do that. And you would need to understand all those other steps of the Eightfold Path to put it together enough and seek guidance to get to the jhanas. And by that point, you should have a well-developed relationship with a teacher that as you observe and they observe that you're moving into the jhanas, then that's the time to start working on these fetters. I don't suggest that anybody who's just starting this program put a whole lot of effort into learning these 10 fetters right now at this point. This is kind of like a heads up. It's like, hey, this is where things are headed. This is why the mind's in the unenlightened state. These are the things that need to be eradicated. And now that you understand this kind of 
Eightfold Path that we talked about the last three sessions, and now that you understand the eradication of these fetters, and that's what ultimately needs to happen in order to get to enlightenment next week, okay, let's start at chapter one in the book, now that you kind of have this overview of the whole path. So if any of these fetters you're not understanding, you're welcome to ask questions about them. I will share with you. But in terms of really going in and try to eradicate any of this stuff right now, the thing that you're working on most importantly is that ignorance. By learning and practicing these teachings with the books and the classes, the podcasts and all the other resources, maybe having personal guidance sessions at different times, asking questions in classes in the Facebook group, you're working on that ignorance by gaining the wisdom. But the wisdom that you need to gain is starting at the beginning with the three universal truths, the four noble truths, the eightfold path, the five precepts. Those are the things that I'm going to be starting off with as we get going in this book, the real core, the real heart of this book and the real heart of this program is going to share with you these core teachings that you need to really get moving forward in your practice. And then the more that you develop your relationship through being in classes and asking questions and perhaps having personal guidance here or there, as you develop your practice and observe the improvements where the jhanas are starting to be experienced, that's the time to really focus in on these. And I would like to add one other thing too, is that I know of these fetters and I know them really well inside and outside. So everything that I'm teaching you, whether it's on Wednesdays with meditation or it's each Sunday that I'm teaching or in any of the other classes, wherever I see these certain fetters in your mind as I'm interacting with you or as I'm teaching, I'm guiding you on this path to eradicating these fetters, but I might not necessarily be calling it out as a certain fetter. So if I'm talking with a student and I'm seeing certain arrogance or certain pride, I might ask certain questions and kind of help you to see that for yourself rather than going through like, all right, pull up a chair. Now it's time to start focusing on the fetters. There's things that your teachers are doing in their interactions with you through the classes and the resources and their interactions that we have that we're helping you to eradicate these fetters because we understand what they are and we can see when they're arising in the mind. And then as you progress and you learn more and more what these fetters are, then you can take a more active approach to eliminate them. But everything that I'm guiding you towards is to eliminate these fetters, even though I might not be calling it out that way as I'm actually teaching in certain classes. Thank you, David. Let's get a basam now. Well, Holly has a question. She asks, I don't have concern or worry about what other people think of me, but I do consider how this would affect my family. For example, if I look a certain way or make decisions that others do not understand, it can create discontentedness for my husband and kids. Should I make an effort to accommodate them since they are unaware? If I do not, it is perceived as uncaring. This is a case-by-case basis, Holly. There's really no permanent answer that can really apply in all situations. But it sounds like some of what's in your question there, that you're kind of adopting other people's expectations, other people's wants, other people's craving, desires, attachments, and you're kind of adopting that and making it your own. And what you need to understand is you can't do that because you're going to be constantly trying to figure out amongst the people that you're interacting with of who's got this craving and who wants it this way and who expects it this way. And you're having to modify what you do in a day-to-day basis based on all the desires and the wants of everybody around you. This is where the mind's not liberated. It's not free because you're adopting other people's craving, desires, attachments, wants, and expectations. In order to be liberated, you have to be liberated from that stuff and just be the person that you're going to be. And if other people disagree with that, then they disagree with that. And if they have a craving for you to be one way or another, that's their issue. That's not your issue. But if you adopt other people's expectations, you'll never get to enlightenment because You have to get rid of your own craving, desire, attachments. Why would you adopt other people's wants and expectations and craving, desire, attachments? So the way to free yourself from this is just to make the decisions that are in your best interest as an individual. And 
do what you feel is best based on the wisdom that you have. If other people are going to become discontent about that, that's them causing that. You're not causing their discontentedness. And that has a question. She says, the mind is associating the first fetter of personal existence view as being closely tied with conceit. Yet, we see them separate from one another. How would one distinguish clearly between the two? And if eradicating personal existence, would that not clearly touch upon one's fetter of conceit, which has origin in the self? Uh, can you repeat the second part of that question? Bossum? Yes, sure. Yes. Uh, would that not clearly touch upon one's fetter of conceit, which has origin in the self? Okay. So what we call the ego is really personal existence view and conceit. The difference between these two is personal existence view is how the mind falsely believes, mistakenly understands, and has this false perception or this misperception that this physical body in this mind is the permanent self. It has this personal existence view. It identifies with this body in the mind as being who you are as a person. That's what personal existence view is. And that's part of what we call the ego, but not entirely what we call the ego. The conceit is the arrogance, the pride, the judging, the measuring, the comparing as being superior, inferior to other people. And it's important to separate the two and look at them separately. Even though we call both of these things the ego, if you look at chapter 16, I split them out and show them in very distinct ways of what each one of these fetters are and how to eradicate them separately because it really helps to see them as very separate. So if you can understand personal existence view is the false belief, the misunderstanding, the misperception that the physical body and mind is the self, that's what personal existence view. The mind thinks that there is a self here. It believes, the unenlightened mind believes that this is the self, but there is no self. And what conceit is, is it's the arrogance, the pride, like, wow, look at me. Look how great I am. You know, I'm above all these people and I'm going to start talking down to people. I have this pride. I have this judging of others thinking that they're either above me or below me. These are two different aspects of the mind and they both need to be eradicated to get to enlightenment. And then also ask us, wouldn't the pattern of ignorance be the root of all the mind patterns? Why is this separate? Yes, the ignorance is the number one hindrance, the number one problem in the entire mind. And that's why I think it's number 10, you know, even though I don't think the Buddha put him in any particular order, that's why it's one of the upper fetters because it's one of the last things to go. And it's this constant accumulation of wisdom throughout your life practice to be able to get to the point where all of the other stuff is eliminated from the mind. You have to develop the wisdom of all of these other fetters. You have to develop the wisdom of all these other teachings in order to get to enlightenment. So it's the number one thing that is keeping the mind in the unenlightened state. And everything comes back to ignorance in some way or some fashion. Thanks, Richard. No more questions for now. Okay. So let's look at the four stages of enlightenment. And then we'll also talk about this other individual that's not a stage of enlightenment but we'll talk about it so there's four stages there's what we call stream enter once returner non-returner and arahant those are the four stages of enlightenment and then there's this unique individual that is an arahant they're in the four stage of enlightenment but we call them a buddha it's not a stage of enlightenment but it's an individual the last buddha that's currently known to the world existed over 2,500 years ago. We're going to talk in detail about what a actual Buddha is. The reason why the Buddha called the first stage of enlightenment as the stream enterer is because he talked about logs floating in a stream, going further and further in bigger and bigger waterways, and ultimately getting to the ocean. And the ocean is like enlightenment. And these logs that enter the stream 
they can kind of get hung up along the way to enlightenment. But once somebody enters the stream and they're this stream enter, they're this first stage of enlightenment, the mind doesn't regress from there. It's only a matter of time before that being actually attains enlightenment, either in this life or some future life. So that's why he calls it a stream enter because he associated this pathway to enlightenment as getting to the ocean. And in order to progress to get to enlightenment or to the ocean, you would need to enter the stream. And once you've done so, your mind won't regress out of the first stage of enlightenment. Moving on to the individual fetters and kind of putting those together with the stages of enlightenment. The first stage, the stream enterer, you would need to eliminate the first three fetters, personal existence view, doubt, and wrong grasp of behavior and observances. Once somebody enters the stream and they're a stream enterer, this first stage of enlightenment, they've already experienced the jhanas, but they've eliminated these first three fetters They've significantly diminished discontentedness, but they still have central desire and they still have ill will. They still have anger. They still have hatred, but they're experiencing a significant diminishing of discontentedness. At this stage of enlightenment, should somebody die, they will return back to the human realm on their next rebirth and they will have future rebirths, no more than seven, a maximum of seven and they will ultimately attain enlightenment. So some people set their goal to become a stream enter, and that's kind of like what they would like to do in this life. I don't suggest that. That's like shooting for the stars, and if you miss, you're gonna fall back to Earth, right? It's better to shoot for the moon and you know try to get to the moon, which is the enlightened mental state, the fourth stage of enlightenment. So that's what a stream enter is, is someone who's reach this first stage of enlightenment and they've done that through putting together the eightfold path and all those other teachings moving through the jhanas and eradicating these first three fetters a once returner they've already eliminated the first three fetters because they would have had to move through being a stream enter in order to have removed those first three fetters and then they have thinned the fourth and fifth fetters so they've thinned central desire It's still there, but it's significantly diminished. They've thinned ill will. So they still have anger, hatred, ill will, but they've significantly thinned it, right? There's only certain relationships or certain situations where anger or hatred or ill will arises. So they still have some, but it's very much greatly thinned. And this is what we call a once returner. If somebody dies in this stage of enlightenment, they will come back to the human realm one more time and they will attain enlightenment in that next rebirth. But that's not the goal because who wants to go back through learning how to crawl, walk, run, jump, skip? Who wants to learn how to talk all over again, read and write all over again? All the heartache and misery that we may have gone through as part of growing in the relationships, you are going to need to develop in that new existence again. It will be easier for you to get to enlightenment in that next rebirth, but you still have to go through all the work to develop your life practice. So even though a being has eliminated the first three fetters and thinned the fourth and fifth, when they're reborn in that next life, they actually have all 10 fetters again it's easier for them to eradicate them and ultimately get to enlightenment in that next rebirth, but they still have to go through all that work in order to get there. So this isn't ideal, but that's what happens if somebody gets to that second stage of enlightenment. The third stage of enlightenment is called non-returner. If you get to this stage of enlightenment, you would need to eradicate all the five lower fetters, personal existence view, doubt, wrong grasp of behavior, in observances, sensual desire, and ill will. A being who gets to this point in their practice is still experiencing discontentedness, but it's few and far between. It's very minimal. If they die in the third stage of enlightenment, they will be reborn into the heavenly realm and they will attain enlightenment from the heavenly realm. Beings in the human realm, in the heavenly realm, can attain enlightenment. 
in the lower realms of hell, animal realm, and afflicted spirits, you can attain enlightenment from those lower realms. So a being who gets to the third stage of enlightenment, while they're experiencing a pretty peaceful life in this human existence, they're still going to experience one more rebirth in the heavenly realm and they'll attain enlightenment from there. But again, that's not ideal. That's not what you would like to occur. What you would like to do is get to this fourth stage of enlightenment that's called Arahant. To attain this stage of enlightenment, you would need to eradicate all 10 fetters. And having eradicated all 10 fetters, there will be absolutely no discontentedness in the mind whatsoever for the rest of this life. The mind will be completely peaceful, calm, serene, and content with joy permanently. And there is no more rebirth. That being is completely done. They've escaped the cycle of rebirth. There's no more fetters. There's no ball and chain keeping them trapped in this cycle of rebirth. And their mind is experiencing complete and utter peacefulness, no longer to be reborn anywhere ever again. That's what these four stages of enlightenment are and how the fetters map into those. Do you guys have any questions on these? I was wondering if the fetters that we experience are similar across our, our different lifetimes. For instance, if a person is struggling with one fetter, is that an indication that in a past life they also struggled with it? Is there some similarity there? If they're struggling with it in this life, it means they surely uh, were struggling with it probably in a prior life too, most likely, and they just don't have the wisdom of how to eradicate that. There's some people who have practiced these teachings in the past and they find it easier when they get into a subsequent rebirth because there's some residual memories there that make it easier for them. So if you're finding that you have a significant amount of ill will in this life, that's a probably a good indication that you had a lot of ill will in previous lives as well. But in reality, it truly doesn't matter what transpired in previous lives. What really matters is what's going on right now in this life, because you have to eradicate these 10 fetters right now in this life. And having attained this human birth, it's the most ideal birth to be able to eradicate these fetters and actually attain enlightenment. Because it's in this human realm that we experience pleasant feelings, painful feelings, and feelings that are neither painful nor pleasant. So since we experience the full range of discontentedness, and we have the capacity and the capability to develop and cultivate our mind, it's ideal for us to attain enlightenment in the human realm. In the heavenly realm, while those beings can attain enlightenment, they're only experiencing exclusively pleasant feelings. The mind is still discontent, but it's exclusively pleasant feelings. So they don't typically have the motivation to learn and practice to attain enlightenment. So oftentimes beings in the heavenly realm will fall back down to either human or lower into the lower realms like hell, animal or afflicted spirits because they're not practicing the teachings. They become complacent because while those non-returners, they do get reborn into heaven and they can attain enlightenment from that realm and they will attain enlightenment from that realm as a non-returner. That's not the only way to get to heaven. There's beings that aren't practicing these teachings that aren't a non-returner who also make it to heaven. And those beings oftentimes are very complacent and they ultimately get reborn into other realms and they continue to be stuck in the cycle of rebirth. So the goal would be to not end up in heaven, but instead to learn and practice now, get to this enlightened mental state as an arahant and just be done with the whole thing once and for all. And to clarify, a, a person would go through all four stages or could go through all four stages of enlightenment in one lifetime. They wouldn't necessarily have to have went through the first two in the past life or something of that instance. Right. Any being who's alive today, they've already had countless rebirths in the past. You may not remember them, but you've had countless rebirths. And the, most of those rebirths have been in the animal realm. And you've been constantly wandering and roaming throughout this whole cycle of rebirth multiple, multiple times, countless rebirths. You may or may not have ever been human in the past, but let's just say this is your first human rebirth. You could, in this life, make it all the way to enlightenment as an arahant in just this one human rebirth. 
or there's some people who are going to need more than one human rebirth. This is interesting to talk about. People tend to be interested to talk about it, but the goal is just to stay focused on learning and practicing, building up your practice and keep working towards enlightenment. And should you not get to enlightenment in this life, your next rebirth is going to be in a better situation, which will make it easier for you and a bit less difficult and less of a struggle to experience progression on this path in a future rebirth. But the goal would be for you to actually attain enlightenment in this life, whether it's your first human rebirth or you've had previous rebirths in the human realm before. doesn't really matter at this point. You're human now and you can focus on these teachings and actually get to enlightenment in this life. And I was wondering if there are any benefits or dangers to knowing what stage we may be in at this point or in the future. Yeah, so these stages of enlightenment are for personal development purposes only. You and your teacher might talk about these at different times, but being obsessed about where you are on the path or even trying to measure and compare and talk to other people about where they feel that they are, it's actually fraught with errors because as you see conceit, this arrogance and pride, it's one of the upper fetters and it tends to be one of the last things to go as part of your journey to enlightenment. So the ego is always going to be there with that arrogance and pride trying to make you think you're more enlightened than you really are. Because if the ego can convince you that you're more enlightened than you really are and you start believing that and you get puffed up with arrogance and ego and pride, then the ego can stick around for longer. The ego is kind of like this bad tenant that doesn't want to leave. They never pay you rent. They never provide any benefit and they never want to leave. And once you look like you've convinced them to leave and get out, they kind of sneak back in. Right. So if you use these stages of enlightenment as a way to kind of puff yourself up or feel boastful or talk to other people and try to compare where you're at, then this is just the ego this is just the conceit and it's just actually diluting the mind further and making it more difficult for you to progress through these stages. A wise practitioner, in my view, wouldn't even rely on self-assessment. You know, they would use these fetters as a way to kind of plot and plan their personal development and their personal growth. But if you think that you're a non-returner or you think that you're a stream enterer or a once returner or any of these other things, that can really dilute the mind because that's where the arrogance and the pride can arise in the mind. And actually, the mind isn't going to be able to progress because of that arrogance and pride. So it's good to use this as personal guidance and to kind of plot your steps. But don't allow the mind to get obsessed and try to do all this self-assessment. Because even when the mind is enlightened as an otter hunt, my suggestion is that you don't even convince the mind that it's actually enlightened, is that even when you get to otter hunt and you've eliminated all of these 10 fetters, if you don't even believe that you're enlightened and just set that whole thing aside, but you've observed for one year, two years, three years, four years, five years, you haven't had any discontentedness whatsoever, you pretty much know that the mind is enlightened, but don't convince the mind of that. Because that's where complacency can come in. That's where the arrogance and pride can come in. That's where you maybe become a bit complacent. And if those things happen, then you're not enlightened. So if you just kind of know that, hmm, for two years, I haven't had discontentedness. That's interesting. Great. And you just stay humble about that, not needing to tell people, not needing to get any admiration from anybody, then you can stay steady and stable in that stage of enlightenment and your mind will continue to experience no discontentedness. And even when the mind is in that fourth stage of enlightenment, it can continue to evolve. So it's not like you get to the finish line and it's like, all right, now I'm done. I can just completely sit back and do nothing. That's not what an otter hunt is going to do. Instead, if you never convince yourself that the mind is enlightened or that you are an otter hunt, then you can just continue with your practice, continue evolving the Eightfold Path, continuing to stay dedicated to meditation, and you're going to see increased amounts of focus, clarity, concentration, memory. You're going to see deeper and deeper wisdom on all different types of topics start to accumulate in the mind, and you'll start to develop more and more wisdom. Because in order to get to otter hunt, 
you would have had to learn, reflect, and practice so many things to be able to get there. You've been on this journey of self-improvement or improvement of the mind for many, many, many months and years. And when you get to Otter Hunt, that person is not going to just say, all right, I'm done now. I'm going to stop improving. You've already been improving for so long that you're always going to be interested in improving the mind. And by not convincing yourself that you are enlightened or that you are Otter Hunt, then you'll stay committed and dedicated to that continuous improvement. Thank you, David. Rich has his hand raised. So let's get a Rich now. Yeah, hi. Um, so you said the last arahant was go go to Mabuda, and also saying that a stream enterer only has seven more rebirths. Those don't really seem to go together because if it seems like there's been plenty of stream enterers over the last twenty five hundred years. So does that mean that most of the people that attain arahant are not people? I guess beings would do it from the heavenly realm? Yeah, I didn't say that the last otter hunt was Gautama Buddha. I said that the last Buddha okay. was Gautama Buddha, the one that's currently known to the world is Gautama Buddha. Okay. And in order to be a Buddha, you would need to be an otter hunt. But there surely has been stream enterers, once returners, non-returners, and otter hunts since Gautama Buddha over the last 2,500 years. There's otter hunts that exist today. There's also stream enterers, once returners, and non-returners that exist today as well. Okay, I understand. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. We have a question that's come in from YouTube, from IA. Is feeling proud of your work seen as arrogance? Yes, that pride of your work, it's that conceit, right? It's the ego that wants to take pride in your work. So a better way to approach this is to do your work, do a good job, know that you're doing a good job and do it because it's the right thing to do. Once you allow pride to come into the mind, that's where the mind can become boastful and arrogant and it can come out in your speech and your actions. And this will be detrimental to you in your professional life. So you can apply effort, you can apply energy, you can be diligent in your work, you can apply determination and dedication, ensuring that you're doing a good job, but do that because you know it's the right thing to do, not because you're chasing after this pride and you would like to kind of puff up and hold on to this pride. Just let the pride go and do the right thing because you know it's the right thing to do. Thank you, David. Those are all the questions we have for now. Okay, so let's talk about what a Buddha is. This can kind of help Rich in his questions too, perhaps, is these four stages of enlightenment can be experienced by any human being, any male, female, old, young. It doesn't matter what your sexual orientation is. It doesn't matter your marital status. It doesn't matter if you have kids or not kids. It doesn't matter if you're a household practitioner or an ordained practitioner. Everybody and anybody can experience stream entry, once returner, non-returner, and otter hunt. You can experience these stages of enlightenment. But a Buddha is a very unique individual. And we only see a Buddha every so often. The last Buddha that the world currently knows about is Gautama Buddha, who existed over 2,500 years ago. There's three primary criteria that make a Buddha a Buddha. And then there's some others that I'll talk about as well. I'll talk about some of those. But the first three primary criteria that make a Buddha a Buddha is that they would have attained enlightenment through their own efforts without guidance from any teachers whatsoever. Essentially, they've discovered the path to enlightenment on their own. They've done all the work to figure out how to get to enlightenment without the support without the guidance without any effort from any outside source to contribute to their enlightenment so they've independently figured out how to get to enlightenment on their own that's the very first thing the second criteria is once they awaken to enlightenment they will then declare their teachings and they will share their teachings with other beings based on what they learned through their own independent journey they will have this deep, 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 profound wisdom 
that they will then share that wisdom with others, guiding countless other people to enlightenment during their lifetime. This is what Gautama Buddha did, is once he awoke from enlightenment, he attained enlightenment, getting to this peaceful, calm, serene, content mind with joy, he then declared his teachings through sharing those with anybody who was interested in learning. And then those people who were interested in learning, he guided people to enlightenment. And during his lifetime, countless people would have attained enlightenment. And during the lifetime of a Buddha, they dedicate their entire life to sharing the teachings that lead to enlightenment, the path to enlightenment. So once they awaken and they have this independent wisdom, they now spend the remaining time of their life sharing those teachings into the world. The Buddha attained enlightenment at the age of 35, and he spent the next 45 years of his life sharing those teachings all the way until he died. In fact, his last words when he died was a teaching. He delivered teachings from the moment that he awoke to enlightenment until the moment he died. Everything that he spoke from point A to point B was all about the path to enlightenment. So that's the second criteria, is they share the teachings into the world, guiding countless people to enlightenment during their life, dedicating the remaining time of their life to sharing the teachings into the world. And then the third criteria is that they leave their teachings in such a condition that after their death, countless more beings attain enlightenment. So the Buddha, having shared for 45 years, there were countless beings that attained enlightenment during his life. Those 45 years that he was teaching, there were countless people that attained enlightenment. And then once he died, those people continued to share his teachings into the world and more and more and more people continued to get enlightened. And now where we are today, 2,500 years later, these teachings have kind of diminished in the world. They're not as bright and as vibrant as they were during the lifetime of the Buddha, but even today, they still produce enlightenment in certain beings. So these are the first three criteria that make a Buddha a Buddha. They attain enlightenment on their own. They declare the teachings and guide countless beings to enlightenment based on their independently discovered teachings. And then they leave their teachings in such a condition that countless more people can attain enlightenment after their death. And that's how we know that the Buddha was a Buddha. During his lifetime, not really many people called him the Buddha. He didn't even refer to himself as a Buddha. It wasn't really until he died that all these criteria could be observed that they actually were met, and that's how we know that he was a Buddha. During his lifetime, he referred to himself as the Tathagata, which means the one who discovered the truth. Today, we refer to him as a Buddha because these three main criteria fit to what he experienced and what his life was like. But during his lifetime, he referred to himself as the Tathagata. There's some other criteria that make a Buddha a Buddha, and there's quite a few, but here's just a couple more that aren't necessarily as obvious. A Buddha is going to have a very profound memory, very different than the average ordinary person. Their memory is such that they can recall their rebirths in the past, and they can remember countless details about those rebirths, and they can remember countless details about their current life as well. And it's that ability to remember things that actually leads to their ability to attaining enlightenment on their own. That's the reason why they can attain enlightenment on their own, is because they accumulate this wisdom over multiple lifetimes that ultimately culminates in them being able to attain enlightenment without the benefit of anyone else because they've accumulated this wisdom for multiple lifetimes. Where an average human being, the ordinary person, is going to have a certain memory of certain events in their life, as they progress in life, their memory is going to be overwritten. So right now, you probably don't remember a whole lot about your childhood. You might remember certain little things about your childhood, but you don't remember it in excruciating detail because your mind, much like a hard drive, gets overwritten. So the files in the past get deleted and there's kind of like a little bit of memory, but pretty much your memory and your recall is 
just kind of a certain time frame in your life, but you don't recall the intricate details of all the various aspects of your life from this life and previous lives. A Buddha's memory is so crisp and so clear. They have an excellent memory where they can remember things from this life and their previous lives, which accumulates into the wisdom that ultimately leads to their enlightenment. A Buddha can also quickly determine the condition of another person's mind. Through interacting with a person, they can observe the parts of that person's practice that is hindering them from attaining enlightenment. And a Buddha can essentially quickly diagnose what's going on in another person's mind. And they only are able to do this because of their wisdom is so profound, having eradicated these 10 fetters and understanding all these teachings as deeply as they do, having worked on their own mind, they can observe the qualities of other people's minds that are hindering them from attaining enlightenment. And then with that understanding, then they can then offer that person teachings if that person chooses to seek guidance as a way to cultivate the wholesome qualities of mind and eradicate the unwholesome qualities of mind. A Buddha wouldn't force their way in and try to control or dictate or force somebody to learn and practice with them and ordering somebody around in a domineering way in order to force them to attain enlightenment because that's not possible. But if a practitioner chooses to learn with them as being a student of a Buddha, a Buddha would have that deep, profound wisdom, having attained enlightenment on their own, that they can very easily provide the teachings to help that being to enlightenment. And they have this ability to quickly diagnose the mind of their students and provide them teachings that will help them along the path to enlightenment. So this is another quality of a Buddha. Another quality of a Buddha is that as they develop their practice and they're gaining this wisdom and they eradicate these fetters from the mind, they are not only sharing the teachings into the world to help other people attain enlightenment, but they're deeply practicing their own teachings. That's one of the ways that they actually guide people to enlightenment is through being a role model for their students so that people can observe what it looks like to practice the teachings in the world. So a Buddha is like a living, breathing, walking example of their teachings. They don't teach right speech and practice wrong speech. They don't teach right action and practice wrong action. So a Buddha is going to have this deep practice of their own teachings, and you will be able to observe this about a Buddha if you ever interact with one, that they're a living, walking, breathing example of their own teachings. And like I mentioned, this is one of the ways that they guide their students is that they practice their teachings and their students are not only learning the teachings through discourses and through guidance, but they're also being able to observe that this teacher, the Buddha, is practicing them and what that looks like having somebody actually practice the teachings in a living, walking, breathing example of what the teachings look like when they're being practiced by a very deep, deep, deep practitioner. So a Buddha is going to be a very deep practitioner of their own teachings. There's other criteria as well, but these are some of the main criteria that I'll share with you. So let me see what questions you guys have about what a Buddha is or any of these criteria that we talked about. Let's go to Nick. Yes, teacher. I have a question from Christina. She asks, and I think she's referring to uh, Gautama Buddha um, being the last known Buddha 2,500 years ago. She asks, is that why enlightenment is harder to attain as the ones that attain it have moved on and are much less present on earth to continue teaching? Yes, that's part of it. But the main reason why it's become more challenging for people is because of impermanence. When the Buddha taught 2,500 years ago, the teachings were shining in the world. They were very bright. They were very visible because a Buddha has such deep and profound wisdom. Their immediate students are going to have a lot of very deep wisdom about the path to enlightenment and what it takes to attain enlightenment. But then as time goes on, the impermanence, things constantly changing, 
over time, these teachings are going to diminish over time. And the Buddha actually talked about this during his lifetime. He knew that his teachings were going to diminish. He talked about these 500-year cycles, and there were five of them. And he talked about how his teachings were going to diminish throughout the next 2,500 years. And he labeled each one of these five 500-year cycles and what we would experience in those 500-year cycles. And he also gave teachings about how to ensure his teachings lasted for as long as possible. And now we're in a period of time where the Buddha explained that there would be all this fighting and feuding amongst ordained practitioners, household practitioners, and people wouldn't even agree what his actual teachings were. And he talked about this in his teachings that household practitioners will be arguing and fighting and festering, that ordained practitioners will be arguing, fighting and festering, and there would be this enormous lack of wisdom about what his teachings were, and the number of people attaining enlightenment would be significantly diminished. And then he talked about this new Buddha, Maitreya, that would arise in the world and share his teachings into the world and share them in such a way that the entire world could then learn them, practice them, and the entire world would be able to attain enlightenment over multiple generations from that point forward. So the reason why we see the difficulties that we see now is because we are 2,500 years away from when a Buddha actually existed. Had you have lived during the lifetime of a Buddha or shortly thereafter, the teaching would be really bright and very vibrant in the world, and you would be able to attain enlightenment much easier than a thousand or fifteen hundred years or two thousand years after his death. But now we're living in that period of time that the Buddha said that there would be a new Buddha who would arise and share these teachings. So this is the ideal time to actually work on learning and practicing so that you can attain enlightenment in this life. Thank you, teacher. She has a follow-up question. She's wondering if uh, her, her daughter, Kaya, can schedule her time with you to, to discuss the hurdles that she's facing one-on-one in your private discussions. For example, is there, is there any age limits? Oh, no, absolutely. Anybody can schedule with me and receive guidance. I've taught children as young as even six months, a year old, uh, showing them some respect and showing them how to appreciate their parents. And even children that were, you know, three, four, five, six, eight, 10, 12 years old and beyond. And I've even taught people as old as 90, 95, 98 years old. So there's no limit to the ability to actually share these teachings. So if uh, your daughter would like to schedule and you would like to be there with her as well, or if you would like her to have some private time with me, you can do that. So go ahead and schedule and then I can help her to get started on the path. And if she would like regular appointments, she can do that as well. Thank you, Teacher David. You're welcome. Hey, David. We may not be Buddhists ourselves, but are the qualities of a Buddha things that we can work toward? And is it good for us to look at the Buddha as a role model, as, especially when we look at the Buddha having a deep practice of the teachings and leading by example? Is that something that we should also be striving to do as we walk the path? There are certain aspects of a Buddha's practice that you can absorb and you can model your practice after. But then there are certain things that you're just not going to be able to do because of the Buddha's unique ability to teach in the world and their profound memory there's just certain things you're not going to be able to do you're not going to have the memory of an actual buddha but you can experience all the wisdom and you can experience that peaceful calm serene and content mind with joy as a buddha so where like the buddha realized early in his path to enlightenment that causing pain to the physical body you know, piercing the body with implements or hanging himself upside down from trees and things like this doesn't lead to enlightenment and even starving the body. At one point, he was starving his body. These kind of things you can extrapolate. You can see like, okay, the path to enlightenment doesn't involve inflicting pain to the physical body. It's about training the mind. So there are certain aspects of his life and his journey that you can extrapolate. It can benefit your path to enlightenment. And of course, all of his teachings, the Eightfold Path and all those other teachings, 
you can be learning and developing your practice that way. That's why I really suggest that you have really high quality translations like I offer in this book series. Because if you learn how a Buddha actually speaks and you have really good high quality translations, then that will help you to develop your practice of right speech, for example. But there are certain things like the Buddha left his family and ordained for a period of time. He left his family. Not everybody needs to do that in order to attain enlightenment. Ultimately, his family joined him and ordained with him and his son and his wife and others attained enlightenment. But you don't necessarily have to ordain. You don't have to necessarily go off in the forest because you're not a Buddha going off in the forest alone by yourself. You're not going to get to enlightenment. You're going to need some guidance from a teacher. So there are certain aspects of his life that you can extrapolate lessons from and that will help you in your journey. But then there are certain things that aren't going to apply to you. And if you understand these differences and what that is, then it can really help you. Because in some traditions, whoever the original teacher is, oftentimes people are encouraged and motivated to just use that person like a template, almost like a cookie cutter, and just model that person 100%. But that's not what the Buddha taught. And that would be permanence. If everybody was to ordain, everybody was to leave their family, everybody was to go out into the forest and all of these other things, you know, that would be permanence and it's not going to produce the same result for everybody. So there are certain things that you can definitely learn from his journey. Of course, his teachings are what's the most important. But in terms of his life and his lifestyle, that's not going to fit for everybody. And the good news is, is that not everybody needs to do that in order to attain enlightenment. Thank you, David. There's all the questions we have right now. Okay. So as I mentioned, there's the seven factors of enlightenment that I had queued up to share with you guys today, depending on what the time is. And if we didn't get it to it today, I was planning to talk about it in chapter three. So it looks like that's what we're going to do is talk about the seven factors of enlightenment when we get to chapter three. And that's where it really is applicable. I kind of put it in here just in case there's time. But this is the second time that I've taught this particular class this way. The first time we didn't have time either. And this time we didn't have time. So it it looks like this material is about what this class can take in terms of one class session. So when we get to chapter three, we will talk about the seven factors of enlightenment, which are essentially tools to help you bring the mind to the middle. It's one more tool to help you produce enlightenment. And we'll talk about it there. What we're going to be doing next Sunday is we're going to be starting chapter one of this book. So if you've downloaded this book, if you've printed it out, if you've ordered it from Amazon, now is a good time that you can start reading the preface in chapter one if you haven't already done so. Because next week we're going to be talking about chapter one, which is the universal teachings. Love, good morals, and do no harm. And this is where we will help you to understand how a lot of these different traditions that are out there, whether it's Hinduism, Christianity, uh, Muslim teachings, and others, you're going to see some similarities between what those traditions are and what the Buddha taught. Because the Buddha attained enlightenment and he understood these natural laws of existence to perfection. And what makes a perfectly enlightened one is that their mind isn't tainted by teachers telling them other things. They acquire the wisdom on their own. But the teachers that are part of Hinduism, that are part of Christianity, a part of Muslim teachings, they actually tap into some of these natural laws of existence. You'll see some similarities between what the Buddha taught and what these other traditions taught. So in this chapter, I kind of help you to see and kind of create a bridge to help you see that there's these universal teachings that really apply across all traditions. So if you grew up Christian or you grew up with Hinduism or you grew up with Judaism or you grew up with Muslim teachings or any other teachings that are out there, even grandma and grandpa or mom and dad, you know, we pretty much learn what we call the five precepts from our original caregivers, maybe not to the level of detail that you're going to learn in this program, but we've learned kind of some of the general teachings because they're universal teachings. And we're going to be discussing those universal teachings in the next class. So if you've read 
from the book, the preface in chapter one, you'll be able to come to class with potentially some questions or a better understanding of what that material is so that then in the class, I can just deepen your understanding. Some students might choose to read after class or some students might choose to read before and after. It's totally up to you how you choose to do that. But starting next week on Sunday, I'll now be progressing through this book chapter by chapter one per week. So next week is chapter one, the week after that is chapter two, chapter three, and so forth, all the way until we get to the end of the book. And then this Wednesday, we're gonna be in the fourth class of our four-part series where I'm teaching breathing mindfulness meditation to help you build up your breathing mindfulness meditation practice because you're gonna need that in order to develop your life practice in order to help you along this program by practicing meditation continuously each day, the way that I share in those Wednesday classes, it will help prepare the mind and allow you to better retain what you're learning and build up your practice. If you're joining us for the first time and you haven't been involved in any of those classes, they're all recorded. You can go to YouTube or you can go to the podcast and you'll see that these classes are all recorded. There's playlists there for you that you can go through the previous classes and see what I actually taught and help build up your practice. So that's gonna be the last class for breathing mindfulness meditation for this four part series. Then the following Wednesday, we're gonna start with loving kindness meditation. This is what's gonna help you eradicate that fetter of ill will. The breathing mindfulness meditation is helping you with a lot of different things, but it's helping you with that central desire as well as all the other things that I taught in the breathing mindfulness meditation class. But that fetter of central desire, it's really helping you with that one, but it's also helping you with all the others as well because the main problem with the unenlightened mind is it's holding on. It doesn't wanna let go. So even that personal existence view, it's holding on to that or it's holding on to doubt, or it's holding on to wrong grasp of behavior and observances, and all of these other fetters as well. So what you're doing through learning and practicing the Eightfold Path and practicing something like breathing mindfulness meditation is you're kind of softening up the mind and you're making it easier and easier to let go of things and let go of these 10 fetters. But that's gonna take a lot of time for the mind to gradually evolve and gradually get to that point where it's able to let go of these things. It's gonna take learning, reflecting, and practicing to get to the wisdom of knowing how to do that. So next Sunday, we're gonna be doing chapter one. This Wednesday, we're gonna be doing breathing mindfulness meditation. And then the following Wednesday, we'll be starting our four-part series on loving kindness meditation. So I really appreciate that you guys have all joined and that you're interested in learning and practicing. Really pleased that you've decided to join this program and learn and practice the teachings of the Buddha because the more that you learn and you practice, you'll see that the condition of your mind and your life is just gonna to continue to improve. You're gonna be helping the people around you because you're not gonna be putting out any harm to the people around you. And gradually, as more and more people in the world learn and practice these teachings, all of humanity gets better and better. But our goal isn't to change humanity. That's not the way this works. You have to work on your own practice. So by you learning and practicing, focusing on the real problem, which is your own mind, you only have to fix that one mind. You don't have to go out and fix all of humanity. You just fix your own mind. And by improving the condition of your mind, by developing your life practice, it benefits you, those close to you, and all of humanity. So thank you for attending today's class. Thank you for your participation. Look forward to sharing with you in a future class. Between now and then, have a lovely rest of your day. We'll see you then. Sawadee Thank you for listening to this podcast. To provide support for this podcast, visit patreon.com forward slash support Buddha. To access more teachings, visit buddhadailywisdom.com. There, you will discover a full range of courses, retreats, and online resources to assist you on the path to enlightenment. Remember to establish a daily, consistent meditation practice, along with learning and practicing these teachings. A well-developed meditation practice is the foundation in which to train the mind to attain enlightenment.